Welcome to those of you at MoChurch.tv. Welcome to those of you in the room. So good to have you for week two of Momentum at the Movies. My name is Danny Smith. That's Danny with a Y. Little reference, okay. All right, moving along. So by round of applause, how many of you have ever seen The Karate Kid 1984? All right, all right. Good amount of you. So it's rated PG for moderate violence. I want to give you a heads up for that before we get going here. So this is unabashedly one of my favorite movies of all time. Now, it probably is because of how old I was when it came out, but I love this movie, and anytime it is on in a room, I will stop and be mesmerized, and I will watch the rest of the movie, like no matter what's going on. If you think I don't like you, you can just test that by saying, hey, I'm showing the Karate Kid at my house, house at 3 a.m. on Thursday. Would you like to come? And I'll be like, whether I like you or not, I'll be there, okay? The Karate Kid. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I've probably seen it twice as much as any other movie I've ever seen in my life, and so far I can tell you don't care about any of this. You're just like, who cares? I, it came out when I was 10 years old, 1984. I saw it in the theater with my grandmother, and it mesmerized me as a 10-year-old kid. I came out like doing karate kicks in the parking lot, and just, you know, I loved it so much. I've had four fictional heroes when I was in elementary school. Um, four, Bo and Luke Duke. Luke Skywalker, there's a lot of Lukes on this list, and Daniel LaRusso of The Karate Kid. I mean, I loved The, the Karate Kid. I was such a fanboy. I had the bandana that Mr. Miyagi gave to Daniel. I had that when I was a kid. Uh, I attempted the crane technique on at least one kid in my neighborhood named Aaron Coder. Um, so I attempted that at least once. And I still have songs from the soundtrack in my playlist. I'm at the end of a run on the treadmill, and it'll come on when I'm needing an extra burst. You're the best around. Nothing's going to ever keep you down. I'll sprint it out at the end. I mean, I will. So also, as a side note, when I was researching this, I found out that January 2020, it was announced that there will be the Karate Kid the Musical on Broadway is coming out sometime soon. And it sounds awkward, so I'm there. I'm so in for that. I don't know what that's going to be like. So here's a story if you don't know, because there were three of you that hadn't seen it. Daniel LaRusso and his single mom moved from Newark, New Jersey, all the way across country uh, to Reseda, California, which is a neighborhood in L.A. And Daniel meets and quickly develops a crush on a local rich girl from the hills named Allie. And, uh, and he gets his butt kicked over and over by her freshly ex-boyfriend, who's one of the greatest pretty boy bad boys of all time, Johnny Lawrence. And so he keeps getting entangled with Johnny Lawrence and getting his butt kicked. So Johnny turns out to be a black belt karate champion who basically leads a gang of bullies who are known as what? Cobra Kai, thank you. I'm going to need more verbal response, okay? It's a little too white church for me this morning. Let's get it going, all right? So, uh, so yeah, Cobra Kai. So, just humor me for one moment. If you know the response, then I want you to respond with the proper response of a Cobra Kai right now. Pain does not exist in this dojo, does it? Oh, my gosh, people. I will come out there and shake each one of you. It's 9.55, Okay. We're awake. Okay, let's try again. Pain does not exist in this dojo, does it? Fear does not exist in this dojo, does it? Defeat does not exist in this dojo, does it? Okay, thank you. That was on my bucket list. I had to do that at some point in my life. Okay, so the Cobra Kai, the bullies, they kick Daniel's butt at a soccer tryout. They run his bicycle off the road with their motorcycles, which, of course, are much cooler. And it seems like they're lurking around every corner whenever he's going about life, you know, or checking out a dojo. There they are. Oh, they're Cobra Kai. And it's just always, and the motto that they've learned from their sensei is no mercy. And they take that out on Daniel LaRusso for sure. So Daniel one day goes to a Halloween party, and he makes a really dumb decision. No doubt this is his fault. He pokes the bear. He instigates Johnny Lawrence, and by doing that, he instigates every other Cobra Kai within smelling distance, and they chase them out of this party. Daniel causes a three-car wreck, 
and they chase him through this field, which I think is maybe the coolest scene to me in maybe the whole movie, other than the tournament at the end, is there in these skeleton, very memorable skeleton outfits, chasing him through the dark. There's five of them, one of him, and he's running. He gets to a fence that is around the apartment that him and his mom live in, but he can't get over the fence in time. They grab him, they pull him down, and they beat the grease out of Daniel Russo. They beat the tar out of him, man. They just tear him up. And so they're kicking his butt late at night, and he can't take any more. And right at the perfect time when this brood of vipers, we'll call them, uh, catch Daniel, and they're, they're beating him up, they commence to kick the crap out of him. But at the last second, Arnold from Happy Days shows up <laughs> and assaults five miners. And the plot continues, no one presses charges, the police are never called, and that's how it goes down. Now, the, the, granted, they're seniors in high school, so maybe they had early birthdays, like August or September, maybe they've all turned 18. But if they did, then they were assaulting a minor every time they were beating up Daniel LaRusso, but I digress. Okay, so, so this guy jumps in and, and protects and rescues Daniel from being killed, he's already gotten beat up. And, and so the one who jumps in the fight is actually a guy named Mr. Miyagi, an iconic name now. The maintenance guy at Daniel's apartment building, he's an old Japanese man from Okinawa, played by the legendary Pat Morita. And it's Mr. Miyagi, the janitor ninja for the W. He shows up, he rescues Daniel. And so this mysterious guy then cleans him up, puts stuff in his wounds, gives him some hot tea, and Mr. Miyagi eventually reluctantly agrees to train Daniel, to teach him karate that he learned from his own Okinawan father, who was a fisherman, back where he grew up. Uh, go to John chapter 1. If you've got the Bible app, you can download that for free. John chapter 1, the beginning of a gospel, uh, a written narrative account of Jesus' life and teachings, an eyewitness account. And in John chapter 1, which I'll just briefly summarize, there's, there's something that happens very fast-paced in the narrative, and it basically describes how Jesus gathers the first five of his disciples. He had many disciples, but he had 12 main disciples eventually. But he gathered disciples very rapid fire in John chapter 1. Uh, there's a guy named Andrew, then his brother Simon Peter, then a guy named Philip, then another guy named Nathaniel. Then there's one unnamed, if you read carefully through it, there's one unnamed disciple also. Many scholars believe that that is the author, John himself, John the Apostle, the one that isn't named in the text. And so one thing is I just want to point out is you, you've got to understand the historical impact of what happens in John chapter 1. Like these first disciples, as Jesus begins gathering disciples, he gathers five guys. He starts a place that makes great burgers and fries. Five guys. And so he, he basically gathers these first five. But this, this impacts the world historically what he does right there. Gathering these guys. And so then there's this little verse that could be easily skimmed past, easily breezed by in John chapter 3, verse 32, where it says, at the beginning of all this gathering disciples and the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them. Now, if you are like me, you will breeze past that verse and move on to more interesting narratives in the scripture. But what's interesting is the Greek word here, spent some time with, that is a Greek word, diatribo. And, and what that means is, as it's translated there, to spend time with or to rub off on. So he begins to spend time with them, diatribo. He begins to rub off on them. He spends time in a way that diatribo rubs. Now, this is the way diatribo works, is you spend enough time with someone, and they begin to rub off on you, right? They rub off on you, and, and, and you rub off on them. And that can be a good thing, or that can be a bad thing. Many of you have been in situations where you realized or didn't realize you're diatriboing with someone, and they're rubbing off in a really bad way. Or you were the one diatriboing and then rubbing off in a very bad way. It also happens in a very good way. But either way, diatribo means that pretty soon when you're hanging out with someone, you start talking like each other. You know, I know, right? I know, right? You know, and these things happen where you start talking like each other. You pick up similar interests. You start caring about the same stuff. 
you become more and more like each other. Sometimes you start to look like each other. Sometimes you get married and you diatribo too much. You start wearing matching Winnie the Pooh sweatshirts. Like this has gone too far, okay? But that's diatribo. You rub off on one another. You start to have the same interests and the same habits. So when Jesus starts spending time with the disciples, it's not just a statement about hours and minutes. It was diatribo. He's, he's rubbing off on them. Jesus invited them into his space. He starts gathering disciples, or they're curious about him, and he says, come follow me. And they do, and they spend time with him, and they diatribo. They did life together. He invested in them. He debriefed with them after his public teachings. He allowed them to see how he handled conflict. He answered some of their questions. He, he challenged them. He used their mistakes as teachable moments. And, and all the while, the spirit of Jesus is rubbing off on these guys. They're like, man, his values are different. The things he's teaching, they're, they're so different. They fly in the face of the religious system at the time, and it's the atribo. Luke chapter 6, another gospel, Jesus said this, everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Now notice, trained. This involves training. It's a master and an apprentice. It's a master and disciples. It involves training. But notice also the goal of the disciple in training is not to know more, is not to know more from the master and learn more of their teachings. It's to become like the master. It's to become like him, okay? So there's an old saying that some things are more caught than taught. And now it's not saying that teaching is bad. That's a vital part of, you know, this kind of thing. But it's saying some things you have to be around the person and see it demonstrated in real life, hands-on experience. Some things are more caught than taught. You know, you have to be with people and see them live it out before you know how to live out some of the hard things of faith. Otherwise, you won't even try. Like, that's too difficult. Nobody does that. Well, you're just not been close to someone who does that, who does that by faith. And so some things are more caught than taught. Faith is more caught than taught. Um, character, it's more caught than taught. Uh, obedience to Christ because of your faith is more caught than taught. Faithfulness to God and to others is more caught than taught. You want to learn how to be faithful to the people in your life or faithful to your spouse, it'd be a pretty good idea to be around some people who are faithful to their spouse no matter what, because it's more caught than taught. Somebody can tell you all the time, hey, you stay, you never give up, you blah, 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 or whatever, but until you see it and how that works out in the midst of real struggle, then it doesn't become real. So some things are more caught than taught, and faith, it can't be taught just like it's information. Faith isn't just information. It, it has to be demonstrated, and that's what we call discipleship. That's what Christians have called historically discipleship, and it's a messy time-consuming, hard work of diatribo. It really is rubbing off on each other. And so many church leaders um, uh, that I've networked with over the years, especially since starting Momentum in 05, 06, you know, they're, they're people who are mentors of mine, people who are just buddies that, you know, lead or, or help lead in some way in churches around the country, have been talking about for years that the American church has a discipleship crisis. And, and they, they've said and pointed to historically and in very um, scholarly type ways, some of them, just like, man, we are headed the same way as the church in Europe headed. We're, we're following in their footsteps and, and the crisis is discipleship. Like the church is in big trouble because we're solely relying in many cases or too highly relying on things like billboards and frankly, sermons and, and podcasts and books and websites and YouTube videos and gospel tracks on urinals, okay? I agree, ew, yeah, you should see them, okay? The, so it's just like, we're, now I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. None of, those, none of those things are wrong, but we've relied so highly on them in the American church. Now let me also hand off responsibility to any Christians in the room. You've relied on them. I've relied on them so highly that the American church is in crisis and it's largely a discipleship crisis because the Christian faith was meant to be passed on from one person to another through friendship, through relationship. And, and here's where it's headed. And my friends have been saying this a lot. And, you know, first I'd listen and be like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then over the years, I'll be like, yeah. And then lately I've been like, oh man, yeah. 
And, and that is this. We're, we're creating, a lot of our churches are, consumers and fans, not disciples. We're creating consumers and fans, not disciples. And eventually, there won't be much of a church left for our children. I mean, the church is constantly under 8 million types of attack, internally and externally. And so there won't be much, I mean, just like Europe, there won't be much. Like their church buildings, they're basically things for tourists, tourists to come and look at. Like, wow, look how gorgeous this is, beautiful, four people worshiping in the corner, you know? Like, that's kind of what happened in Europe. And so that is where we're headed in America, and it's because of a discipleship crisis. Um, there's a time at the beginning of the movie, near the beginning of the movie, where Mr. Miyagi, the maintenance man, remember, goes to Daniel LaRusso in his mom's apartment to fix a faucet. And you can tell in the scene, Mr. Miyagi is taken back by the fact that Daniel is learning karate from what? Anybody remember? A book. He has a book open, and he's learning to front kick. And he's just over and over doing front kicks. And Mr. Miyagi's like, you're learning karate from a book? And you can tell he's taken back by that. And the reason he's taken back by that is because the only thing he has ever known is karate being transferred from person to person. It's karate being transferred from father to son or from sensei to student or master to apprentice. The most effective way to learn karate is from another person through apprenticeship or discipleship. You can learn it another way. It just would be kind of weird or unnatural in a way that a Mr. Miyagi would be like, really? You're learning that from a book? Huh, interesting. I mean, maybe in a desperate situation like Daniel's in, if you don't have a mentor then yeah, I can see why you would rely on only a book. But that would be a desperate situation. So to that point, I think early Christians, if they were transferred through time to the 21st century American church, they would probably be a little perplexed at how non-relational Christianity has become in the 21st century. You know, because like karate, Christianity was never meant to be learned just from Christian books or sermons or podcasts or YouTube videos or even just on a Sunday morning from a talking head. It was meant to be learned and developed through personal relationships, through one-on-one, -on -one, person to person, sensei to student, parent to child, master to apprentice. And I'm not saying it can't happen through a book or a podcast or YouTube, but man, if it was only that without the relationship, discipleship connections, it better be a pretty remarkable emergency type situation where this is the only thing I have. I, I'm a student. My, kid, my parents won't let me go to church. It's all I have. Th there are situations where, but it wouldn't be as effective as the relational transferring of faith from one person to another. Um, Jesus like relied on this to spread his story through the world to spread his message to spread the good news of the cross and the resurrection he relied on, he bet the farm on relational discipleship with no plan b no that, that was it i'm gonna pour into these guys and they with the power of the holy spirit have to do their job and they have to go out and that should tell us something that jesus bet the farm on those kinds of spiritual friendships and then after he died on the cross and rose from the grave he told his disciples go and make disciples of all nations so really for a paraphrase there he says disciples go make disciples he tells his students to go gather their own students and to teach them the faith person to person transfer faith from one person to another, diatribo. So The Karate Kid is, man, is the ultimate movie of discipleship. I mean, that's really what it kind of comes down to is Mr. Miyagi sees a young dude who doesn't have a father figure in his life, by the way, and he sees this kid getting his butt kicked by life, and Mr. Miyagi's response is he befriends Daniel, he shares his wisdom with him, and he helps him win. Literally, he helps him win in, in life. And the wisdom he shares isn't just about karate. There's all these little like great Mr. Miyagi-isms throughout the movie where he just dr drops wisdom about life in the middle of teaching him about karate. He tells him things about like, if you're not all in in something, then you'll get crushed like a grape. Like if you're going to go into something, get, go all in. Or he teaches him constant lessons about balance in life. He teaches him things like there's no such thing as a bad student, only a bad teacher. Like, they're learning this from somewhere. You know, he, he tells them, you know, if you look for revenge, you can start by digging two graves. 
You know, I mean, he teaches them these life lessons that are totally aside from karate through their relationship. And I love the Karate Kid and also before the Karate Kid, the Star Wars saga, which we'll talk about later in the series, it reinforced this ancient cultural paradigm of respecting the wise elder, of valuing the wise elder. Now, there are old people who don't have wisdom. There are old people who aren't wise. But there are old people who have practiced wisdom and have so much to offer that it's this great reminder of seeking wise elders as, as just seeing them as valuable. And, and what they have to offer is valuable treasures of wisdom and guidance that they can offer if we are humble enough to let them teach us. And, and that's really like one of the beautiful messages of the Karate Kid and, and even Star Wars before it. So when Mr. Miyagi agrees to train Daniel, he takes Daniel to his home which all of a sudden shows you that this, is, this discipleship is going to be personal. I'm inviting you to my home, not just my maintenance office at the apartment. Here's my home. He invites him there, and he gets down on his knee, and he has a conversation with Daniel Russo. He says, I want to make a sacred pact with you. He says, first, let's make a sacred pact. I promise to teach karate. That's my part. And you promise to learn. I say, you do, no questions. That's your part. Okay, deal? And Daniel Russo says, deal, all right? And, and he's pumped about it. I mean, Mr. Miyagi, that's the scene where Mr. Miyagi gives him his bandana. He's like, I got a bandana now, you know? He's all fired up. I'm going to learn karate. And he holds out his hand to shake Mr. Miyagi's hand for the deal. And Mr. Miyagi puts a sponge in it. Now, wash all the cars. There's a row of cars. And then wax them. You know, he says, right hand wax on, left hand wax off. Breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth. Breathing is very important. Wait, 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 why do I have to answer that? Ah, that, that, that? That's Mr. Miyagi. I'm going to start doing that more often. Ah, that, that. <laughs> I'm talking right now. Ah, that, that. Okay? He says, what are you doing? No, th remember, th remember the deal? We just made a sacred pact. I give you the instructions. You listen. Even if you don't think it makes sense, you listen. I tell you what to do, and you do it. So Daniel washes and then waxes all the cars. He finishes late at night, and he's exhausted. Then he comes back the next time to Mr. Miyagi's house, and does anybody remember the second chore that he gets? It's okay to be wrong. We're all winners here. Not the fence yet. Sand the floor. There we go. Yep. Sand the floor. And so he sands the floor. He gets down the floor. He sands the floor. And he gets down. Sand the deck. You know, right to circle, left to circle. And so then, anybody remember the third one? Paint the fence. Yep. Up, down. Paint the fence. Then whole fence. Oh, I'm done. Mr. Miyagi, my shoulders are killing me. Both sides. Not yet, you know. And so all the fence. And then the last one is paint the house, side to side, paint the house, paint the house. And so th this is the point of my message today is I'm looking for a spiritual disciple, preferably a middle school or high school or someone nice and strong, to renovate my home for the next three months <laughs> for free. And I would like you to have no regard for the Ohio child labor laws. Just forget about that. No, but so what happens is Daniel, he gets mad as a hornet. After he paints the whole house, he comes back, he's mad as a hornet, and he's yelling at Mr. Miyagi, he's kind of cussing him out, and he goes nuts on him, and he's like, you're treating me like a slave, like, like the video we saw earlier, I'm supposed to be learning how to play in a church, you are learning, but you're treating me like a slave, you're supposed to be training me to fight, and in my opinion, the greatest reveal in film history happens at this moment, because I was 10 when I saw it, Okay. And I mean, this blew my mind in the theater. I remember looking at my grandma, looking at the screen like, are you seeing this right now? And so the reveal happens, and that is basically Mr. Miyagi starts throwing punches and kicks at him, and Daniel LaRusso uses wax on and wax off and up, down, side to side, sand the deck. He's using all this stuff to block all these attacks. And then Mr. Miyagi looks at him in the eye and says, come back tomorrow, start early. Like, what in the world? Like, he didn't know the whole time he had been learning karate. And it was this awesome reveal. I get goosebumps every time I see that scene still. And I'm a little older than 10 now. I'm 27. So I'm like, <laughs> but the other day, my son Journey, who's 14, was watching it with me. And I was watching the reveals come. And I was like, oh, man, I'd love to see this through the eyes of someone else. Here comes the reveal. Here it comes. Here it comes. And I watch the scene happens. Hi, hi, hi. He's blocking all this stuff. And I look over Journey. Not even one show of any interest. He's like watching, like, 
oh, cool, sweet, sand on the deck. And we were like, what? This blew my mind when I was 10. It changed my life. I gave my life to Jesus after I saw this scene. <laughs> Man. So it turns out the whole time Mr. Miyagi has been giving him jobs to be a servant, but what's really been happening is he's building his strength and he's training his muscle memory. Building his strength, training his muscle memory. And the point is what Daniel thought was just meaningless service had a purpose. And that's discipleship. Like so much of discipleship is experiencing the reveals of what you thought were meaningless tasks. Why would God tell me to do this? It was such a stupid thing. Someone puts flesh and blood on it. Well, this is why you would do it. This is why you do it. I think this is such a stupid thing. I have to do it every Sunday. I have to do it every time I see this need. I have to do it whenever I'm tempted in this way. And, and so you're like, this is how it becomes is you're like, without that mentor, it quickly becomes a, yeah, 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 I know preacher. Yeah, 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 I know Mo Group leader. I know mentor. Yeah, 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 read the Bible, pray, show up at church, worship, sex is only for married people, give money, wax on, wax off. <laughs> like, right? That's what it becomes without a relationship. And so discipleship, you'll find that if you lean into Letting someone teach you and disciple you why these things are important, person to person, and with the scriptures, which is so important, but you need someone also, this relational discipleship, you'll find that you eventually develop some instincts, some muscle memory. With the help of God's spirit, you develop muscle memory to praise God, wait for it, in your suffering. Well, that's not your natural instincts. You've learned that, right? So otherwise, the suffering would kick your butt. But you learn how to defend yourself. You praise God in your suffering. You learn how to be generous, wait for it, even when you have very little. You, other than this training, you would never, ever be generous with very little. You would make every excuse like every other human being would be, like, well, when I have a whole bunch of money like other people have, then I'll be generous. No, you always are generous. I'll be generous even when I have very little. You say to say no to sexual temptation when you really want to give in. That would be my life without discipleship. That, that would be. I'd give in to every urge and pleasure of any kind except for I've been discipled. I've been shown by other people what it means to say no. Even though I want that, I want something better long term, I'm going to say no. And that is where your, your, your instincts kick in from discipleship and training with the help of the Holy Spirit. And, and to show up at church, even sometimes when you're challenged, when your priorities are challenged by other things, to say, man, I gotta let my muscle memory kick in here. I'm gonna say no to that so that I can keep this my priority. To, to pray, even when you feel like God isn't even there. He's not listening. Your muscle memory has to kick in to say, man, I'm gonna keep praying through this. I don't, even, I don't feel anything from God. I don't feel like he's showing up, he's answering me, he cares all the more reason that muscle memory has to kick in. I have to keep praying to, to forgive and to show mercy when someone wrongs you because every instinct you have is to retaliate, to lash back, to take revenge. But really, your muscle memory, you have to learn from seeing others do it and reading it from the scriptures. You have to learn that in a world that teaches the enemy deserves no mercy, that you say, I'm not going to be offended. I've been insulted, but I'm not going to take revenge. I'm going to forgive 70 times, seven times. I'm just going to keep forgiving over and over. And here's the deal. If you don't have a friend mentor to put that in flesh for you, you know, to say, as the mentor might say, I'm trying to follow Jesus, and there are things you can learn from me, like Paul said in Scripture, follow me as I follow Christ. I, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to follow Jesus, and here's what I can offer you that I've learned. Here's wisdom I can pass on to you. And if you don't have that, you don't have someone to push you, to teach you, to hold you accountable. If you don't have that, the accountability, then you'll never make it to the reveal scene. If you don't have someone to push you, challenge you, encourage you, when things to pray for you, to be cheering for you, to come alongside you, you'll never make it to the reveal scene because you will never paint the whole fence. You will never sand the whole deck on your own. You need someone who will be there to cheer you on, to kick you in the butt, whatever it is you need to keep building strength and also building muscle memory and to grow in Christ. Because if you're like me, you can rationalize anything. This is getting hard. I'm going to stop doing it now. And discipleship is from the same root word as discipline. To be a disciple, same root word, discipline. 
And man, it is always helpful to have a mentor and people cheering for you, challenging you to go further than you thought you could go, and also teaching you things that you didn't know and then showing you how to do it. You'll rationalize it or you'll get lazy uh, or, or you'll never reach your potential when you don't have mentors like that. That's why you need a Mr. Miyagi. You need a mentor. You need to be discipled in Christ unless it's an emergency and you just don't have that at your fingertips. And that's not the case probably for anybody sitting in this world. Someone needs to be there to reveal the payoff if you commit to doing the hard things. Like, I know this is difficult. I know this is counter to how you feel and what you want and what would be good and what would be warm, fuzzy for your emotions. But sometimes the things that God teaches us to do are the difficult things, but there will be a reveal scene, and you will see why. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about the how, how, how in this message. I have taught on that in the past, but one of the reasons I don't want to talk too much about the how is because you can start thinking that's the only way to do it. And this really does look so different for so many people. You are in a different situation than everybody else in this room. And so the way it works for you to be discipled or to disciple, it's going to look different than it would look for me as I try to disciple someone or me as I have my own mentors that I lean on. It's going to look different. But we are going to talk about the how in Mo Groups this week. And so a lot of the how will come in that kind of discussion there. Uh, but I think one of the most touching scenes in the movie is a scene on Daniel's 16th birthday in the movie where he shows up Mr. Miyagi's house. And Mr. Miyagi sings happy birthday to him, brings out a cake for him and all that stuff. And, uh, and then Mr. Miyagi gives him a 1948 Ford Super Deluxe. The yellow car, the first one that he washed and waxed. Now, it makes a little bit of sense because, one, Mr. Miyagi doesn't even have a driver's license. Okay, you got all these cars out here. You don't even drive, man. And also, Daniel's been the one washing and waxing it all this time. You know, so, but it is this amazing gift. And there's this great line that I always get teary-eyed, misty-eyed during, is Daniel eventually, before he drives off in his new gifted car, he says to him, you're the best friend I've ever had, Mr. Miyagi. And, and here's this dude who, he doesn't know his father, or at least he's not in his life. And Mr. Miyagi pulls him under his wing, trains him, gives him wisdom, helps him win. And, and he's like, man, through this, we have become close friends. You're the best friend that I've ever had. No one's ever invested in me like this. No one's ever given to me or cared for me the way that you care for me. And it reminds me of Jesus saying late in the process to his disciples, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. When it comes down to it, discipleship is just spiritual friendship. It really is. And it's the idea of even Jesus saying there, it's where a master and disciple or disciples, they open their lives to one another. Like eventually you get to the point where you're telling someone who you're apprenticing or, or an apprentice is telling their mentor things you never thought you'd be able to share with somebody, but it's because it's the real you. It's the real stuff you struggle with. Like, okay, I don't lead with this stuff necessarily, but now I trust you. You've invested, you care about me. Man, I, I open up my life to you. And, and, and here Jesus talks about everything he's learned. He's made known to his friends, his disciples. And, and this is a vision for momentum right here, is just to say, don't you want to be a part of a church that befriends a lot of people? Don't, don't, wouldn't it be cool if, Mo groups or Sunday morning, you just kind of picture us all going out to our own groups of friends, people that we're befriending in the name of Jesus. It's like, man, I, yeah, you're like you're getting your butt kicked by life. I can find ways to pray for you and pull you under my wing and maybe eventually get to the point where I'm actually officially discipling you and I'm cheering for him, helping you win spiritually. Like what a beautiful picture where we invite other people into friendship and we invest in them, we care, we sacrifice for them. You know, we invite them to our Browns watch parties and our women's retreats and our, our pickup basketball games or to go shooting or to come to our Mo group. And then we let people into our life. That's discipleship. And it even begins before people are Christians. Like, there are ways you can diatribo with people who don't follow Jesus. And they, they catch a little bit of like the, man, I see the spirit of Jesus in you. And those values rub off like, man, I... I feel like even though there's some of this I don't even agree with Christianity, even though there's some of it I don't even agree with, 
But I, I, it's hard to deny some of the values that Jesus teaches and, and what he says is offered to me through the cross. Really? I could be forgiven and have grace too? I mean, that happens even pre-conversion. Discipleship begins pre-conversion. Uh, I want to jump to the end of the Gospel of John, one of the 12 disciples, John the Apostle, and, and point out something I've never pointed out before. It's another one of those verses you just breeze by. I do, because the next verse is cooler, which I won't cover. But you're like, oh, breeze by this verse and the next verse. Whoa, this is the second to last verse in the Gospel of John. John 21, 24 says this. This is the disciple, John the Apostle says, who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Now, John is saying right here, I am the disciple who saw this stuff and wrote it down. Kind of talked about this last week at the beginning of 1 John that he also wrote. But do you notice what happens between the first and second sentence? Look carefully. It goes from this is the disciple, uh, this disciple testifies, this is the one who wrote. It goes from singular to what? We know that his testimony is true. Ooh, this is really interesting. There's an editorial note that is thrown into this letter and, and, and probably is on the very original manuscript, if it still exists, of the Gospel of John. Like, who in the world is this, this editorial? Who's the we? Who wrote that line? Well, not John. It wasn't John who wrote this. It's a little editorial note probably from John's disciples. Like the people that he poured into with his life, it's probably his disciples who added this as their little way to validate, we lived with this man. We've heard these stories so much of our lives, the way that Jesus impacted them, things that he never wrote down. Because church history tells us that John had to be persuaded to write his own gospel. He lived the longest of the apostles. The rest of them were killed and died off. And he lived long enough that he'd been telling these stories and preaching them and sharing them with his own disciples that people eventually, you have to write these down before you die. And he was like, ah, there's already Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and there may have been other gospels up to that point. Who knows? And then eventually he's persuaded, okay, I'll write my own. And it's very different from the other three because he saw what they wrote down. He's like, I'll write different stories than they did. I'll cover other stuff. And he's persuaded to write his own gospel. But a highly respected 20th century British New Testament scholar who I heard about in Bible college all the time, F.F. F. Bruce, he writes this. He says, we cannot be sure who the people are who add their testimonial. We know that his testimony is true. They may have been the group of John's disciples who preserved his record and gave it to a wider public. Now, what's interesting is the disciple John had disciples. Of course, I would know that because Jesus said, hey guys, you, I, I, I'm betting, betting the farm on you. Like the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive God's Spirit to empower you, but I'm betting the farm. You're going to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. You're going to go out and make disciples of all nations. But isn't it weird to picture that John then went out and became Mr. Miyagi for a bunch of other disciples? Starts pulling karate kids under his you know, arm like, I'll invest in you, spiritual investment. And we know from church history that he did this. We know the names of some of these guys. And so there's a guy whose name was Ignatius of Antioch. And Ignatius, he's not the same Ignatius that the high school in Cleveland is named after. That's, you know, that's a 16th century Spanish monk, uh, a priest, um, who that's named after. But Ignatius of Antioch was a contemporary to John the Apostle. And John discipled him. And Ignatius eventually was martyred for his faith, thrown to lions, but he was a disciple of John. That's, that's pretty crazy. And he also wrote seven letters, or what Christians typically call epistles, right after the New Testament to seven different churches. He encouraged them because he knew John. So people were like, this guy learned from John, who learned from Jesus. Let's listen to what he has to say. And so he wrote seven epistles right after the New Testament. Another one of John's disciples was a guy named Polycarp. Polycarp and Ignatius were buddies, which would make sense because they were both discipled by John. And so Polycarp was called, quote, a companion of the apostles because he hung out with John and maybe he met other apostles before they were martyred. And so John ordained Polycarp to be the bishop of a Christian church in the city of Smyrna. And then later Polycarp wrote something called the epistle, the letter of Polycarp to the Philippians. And there's even a document that's about his death called the martyrdom of Poly Polycarp that's by an unknown Arthur because Polycarp was burned at the stake and stabbed with a spear. Now, here's what's cool. Those are two specific disciples of John. 
there's even a little bit more of a ripple effect that's a little bit different, but there's a guy named Irenaeus. And Irenaeus, since we're covering a lot of 80s today, there's a song about him. It goes, boom, boom, ooh, rock me, Irenaeus. That's, okay, 80s. Scratch that, not funny. Don't, don't do that joke in the 11 o'clock service. Thank you. Boom, cha. All right, so Irenaeus was a Greek leader who started, planted, and provided guidance for churches in what's now southern France. It was called Lyon back then, or that's where he was, you know, kind of stationed, basically. But he was known for developing some really important, much-needed theology, what's biblical orthodoxy, and all that kind of stuff. But listen to how it started. This is fascinating. This is a fascinating passage from, this book is the first church history book ever written written in the early 300s by a guy named Eusebius. Highly recommend it. It's a really good English translation by a guy named Paul Meyer. It's fascinating. It was written in the early 300s. And in it, there's a passage. Eusebius quotes Irenaeus. Boom, boom. Ooh, rock me. Okay. So, and, and it's from one of Irenaeus's books that doesn't exist anymore. We only have peace. Well, that's actually not true. We do have books from Irenaeus. Scratch that from the record. But Eusebius quotes one of Irenaeus's works, and he says this. Irenaeus quoted here. When I was still a boy, I saw Polycarp. He says, I remember events from those days more clearly than those that happened recently. What we learn in childhood adheres to the mind and grows with it. So that I can even picture the place where the blessed Polycarp sat and conversed, his comings and goings, his character, his personal appearance, his discourses to the crowd, and how he reported his discussions with John and the others who had seen the Lord. He says he recalled their very words, John did, or Polycarp did, what they reported about the Lord and his miracles and his teachings, things that Polycarp had heard directly from eyewitnesses of the word of life, that's Jesus, and reported in full harmony with Scripture. He says, I listened eagerly to these things at that time and through God's mercy noted them, not on paper, but in my heart. By God's grace, I continually reflect on them. I mean, you're seeing the ripple effect move forward in history of people who were impacted because Jesus and John 1 started collecting disciples, five guys he would pour into, then a burger joint, and then seven more guys, you know, all this stuff. Aaron is saying, I heard Polycarp, who was discipled by John, who was discipled by Jesus, and I remember that what Polycarp said lined up completely with the Gospels and the epistles in the New Testament. That's what he's saying. And what's really cool is, on kind of a fun side note, is you see the same relational effect in The Karate Kid. Fisherman in Okinawa teaches his son, who we know as Mr. Miyagi, karate. Mr. Miyagi doesn't have a living son, and so he pours into Daniel LaRusso, who he pulls under his wing. And then we find out later on in the series Cobra Kai that Daniel pours into and teaches karate to his son and his daughter, and eventually he starts a dojo that is named what? Miyagi-Do Karate. And he has all these disciples, these students, who he teaches what Mr. Miyagi told him. And that's not all. Aside from Daniel, Mr. Miyagi took on another disciple called the Next Karate Kid. He discipled Hillary Swank, and she went on to win two Oscars. <laughs> that's as many as Meryl Streep, Okay. So, I mean, you see this ripple effect, and this is what I want to just end with the challenge is this. Remember, early in the film, if you've seen it, Mr. Miyagi reluctantly agrees to train Daniel. He's just gotten beat up by a bunch of skeleton Cobra Kai. He's, you know, tending to his wounds. He's giving him hot tea, and, and he basically tells him, man, you should go to the Cobra Kai dojo and talk to their teacher. No such thing as a bad student, a bad teacher. Go talk to the teacher, and Daniel's like, okay. That's scary, but maybe that makes sense. Hey, would you go with me? And Mr. Miyagi says, oh, that's no, I don't think so. Wait a minute, why not? He says, for you, good idea to go talk to the sensei. For me, good idea, no get involved. That's his response. He's, no, oh, I've got my own things, I've got my own life, I've got my own troubles. I'm still grieving in different ways. I've got, all, I've got my own things in life. But eventually, Mr. Miyagi does get involved. And he helps Daniel win. He says, okay, I'm reluctant, but I'm going to do this. So many people are getting their butts kicked by life without a relationship with Jesus. Get involved. Help people win spiritually. Let's pray.